Παρακαλώ, υποδεχθείτε στη σκηνή τον κύριο Γκάρι Κασπάροφ, World Chess Champion. Good afternoon. I'm always happy to visit the ancient land of Greece that was the birthplace of two of my favorite things, democracy and philosophy. And uh, I think these two things are very relevant for our conversation today, though they're very ancient, because we are talking about so the definition of AI, to understand what it is. We're still at this early stage, philosophical stage. But also we are debating the impact on society. It's a democracy. I also, by the way, want to mention that Greece was the birthplace of the first analog computer, Antikythera. Uh, and I wonder if they had a debate at the time whether it could put some astronomers out of work. Um, so, but before we move into this conversation and the, and the discussion about what is AI, how can it affect our lives, you know, looking at, you know, positive side and the, and the negative consequences, I would like to just to, to set up it straight and just to present myself not as the great expert in the area, but someone who has a certain experience, both negative and positive, dealing with computers. But also, I would consider myself more like a preacher. Uh, and uh, as a preacher, I have to start with, you know, with uh, a mythology, and actually busting mythology, because AI is surrounded by the thick fog of mythology and our ideas about it that are, have nothing to do with the reality. Again, Let's follow the ancient Greek tradition and just to separate facts from mythology. Uh, one of the things is this, you know, it's this, it's, it bothers me that is all debates about AI, they all carry it like, you know, this a, a, a medieval religious uh, um, confrontation. Uh, there's a small group saying AI, oh, it could be a savior. It will solve all our problems. You know, we can program AI to avoid any conflicts. I mean, you hear stories that, oh, we don't know how to solve the problem, let's say, of a driverless car. Uh, whether it should hit uh, uh, a mother of two or protect the, 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 uh, the driver. The problem is that we don't know the answer. How are we supposed to program AI if maybe different people in this audience could give different answers? So that's one problem. So AI is not going to save us because somehow it's a reflection of what we, who we are. But the much bigger crowd is telling us about the end of the world. AI, it's like, you know, opening gates of hell, Pandora box. The moment we'll enter the world of AI, yes, we're doomed, we're finished. This gang of, or army of doomsayers are trying to paralyze our minds by these dystopian images of the future. Let's make this clear. AI is not a magic wand, but AI is not the terminator. AI is not a harbinger of utopia or dystopia. AI is a technology invented by us, humans, and we have to understand exactly, so how can we use it to benefit from it? And also, we should remember that any technology in the past, any disruptive technology, has been used both for positive and also for negative purposes. Technology itself is agnostic. It's a big mistake to consider that technological progress automatically means the progress of the society. So it's again, it's up to us how we go to use it. But again, before we you know, decide so how humans can collaborate with, with AI, so let's start you know, with, with a definition. And I will leave letter A just for a moment aside, and let's start with I, intelligence, that have no, no uh, um, real debates. So um, behind me on the screen, you see what I call founding father slide. The first one is Alfred Binet, uh, one of the creators of the IQ test. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, Alfred Binet was fascinated by the minds of the chess players. He was so intrigued by the ability of chess players to not just to make moves, but some of them could play blind without looking at the chessboard. So he believed that if he could understand how it worked, he could reveal the secrets of human intelligence. It's very flattering for me as a retired chess player, 
But I can tell you that the aptitude for playing chess is nothing else than the aptitude for playing chess. But I cannot blame him just, you know, for being so fascinated with, with the game of chess. And this affection transcended the generations. And the founding fathers of computer science, Alan Turing, Claude Shannon, Norbert Wiener, they also believed that chess could be the ultimate test for machines' intelligence. They believed that when, and let me emphasize, when, not if, when machines would prevail in the game against best chess players in the world, that would be the dawn. They didn't know the term artificial intelligence. It was invented later. But that would be dawn of machines getting intelligent. Now, by making this, uh, or by dreaming about it, they made one fundamental mistake. Because uh, imagine, they had no access to computing power. It was meager, nothing. So they looked at the game of chess, and according to Claude Shannon himself, the number of legal moves in the game of chess you know, was an astronomical, actually not astronomical, insane number, 10 to the 46th power. Crazy. Compatible to the number of atoms in the solar system. So Claude Shannon and others, they had no other way than to suggest that for machine to prevail against humans, it would have to emulate the way humans were playing. Because brute force was not an option. So um, uh, Shannon came up with the concept of type A machine and type B machine. Type A machines that operate with a brute force, some algorithms. But type B, that was a dream. That a machine that could actually do something like humans. I have to say, you know, take a liberty to say they were wrong simply because they didn't know about Moore's law. They didn't, they could imagine the amount of computing power we're carrying in our pockets today. So um, it was one of the mistakes that was made at the time, but it also, you know, relates to big mistake we're making today. Whether we talk about computers, driverless cars, anything where machines play a role, an important role often in our lives. We think, oh, if it's a machine, it must be perfect. If it's not perfect, it's no good. Uh-uh. It should not be perfect. It should be better. That's it. All we have to ask from these computers, from these machines, AI, you name it, it's for them to make fewer mistakes than humans. It's about improving the bottom line at the end of the day. That's what we should, what we should look for. And in many instances, machines, you know, already could do it. And, you know, the chess is one of the best demonstrations how it happened. So, um, again, it's not about solving. It's about being better. And um, naturally, following these uh, big calls from the founding fathers, there were many chess computers that have been created. Very quickly, programmers discovered that it should not be Claude Shannon type B dream machine. It should be simply brute force. Yeah, with a minimax algorithm, then alphabet pruning, it was very clear that machines were capable of using the brute force and sort of cutting this endless tree of variations to, to, to make it relatively narrow to understand what's good, what's bad. So um, I entered this challenge uh, of human versus machines in 1985, and the picture that you, the slide you see, it uh, demonstrates what chess players call simultaneous exhibition. Maybe some of you played in these exhibitions. When a grandmaster, a professional player, goes around, uh, uh, moves the pieces, and uh, uh, his opponents are responding. The uniqueness of this event that I faced 32 computers. OK, at that time, they were chess playing devices. They could do nothing else but playing chess. So uh, there were four leading manufacturers, eight models each. Maybe some of you still own this piece of antique. I don't know. So it's. Uh, looking at the average age of the audience, I suspect that probably you do. Um, uh, and uh, um, I won all the games, all 32 games. Now, what's important is not that I won all the games, but it was not a surprise. Actually, the surprise would be exactly the opposite if I lost or even drew one game. And when I, because machines were weak. They could play chess, but it still, it was not quite impressive. And when I look at this picture, Oh, it just reminds me of the golden age 
of human versus machines. Because look, machines were bulky and weak, and my stomach was flat and hair was strong. <laughs> 12 years later, I faced only one computer, IBM's Deep Blue. Um, for the sake of historical records, I have to say that it was a second match, and I won the first one in 1996 in Philadelphia. Again, for the sake of historical record. But if we are looking for the watershed moment in the history of human and machines, it was not in 1997, though I lost the match. But actually, in 1996, though I won the match, but I lost game one. Then I fought back, I won three games, and I won the match. But the very fact that machine could beat current world champion in a normal tournament game, six hours tournament game, was already a demonstration that the rest would be a matter of time. It's like sign on a wall that we failed to read. As a matter of fact, I have to say that we already faced other computers. It was not sensational that we played machines because there were chess engines from 1992 that played in competitions. And they could you know, beat even best of us in blitz chess, five minutes chess, or in rapid chess in 25 minutes chess. And again, we made the same mistake. Ah, it's too fast. If we, only if we had more time, we could spend more of the time productively and we'll beat them. Uh-uh. It's not about more time. It's basically, it's, it's a one-way street. We have more time, they have more time, but at the end of the day, they will make fewer mistakes. Deep Blue could make up to 200 million positions per second. Uh, by the way, just, I see some people are just, you know, are, mm, uh, paralyzed by this number, but if you have a free chess app on your mobile device now, it's stronger than Deep Blue. Again, more slow. Uh, but when some people say it's, the, it's the dawn of AI, absolutely not, because Deep Blue was as intelligent as your alarm clock. A very expensive one, $10 million piece. But still, it was not intelligent. It didn't have to be intelligent. This is a bit, another big mistake. Machines can outperform us without repeating the same process. The planes are much faster than any bird without flapping their wings. Deep Blue could win the match, and eventually computers could outperform chess players without outthinking us. So that's another important mistake that we still, I was still making very often. We, we try to understand exactly how the process works. Eventually, we have to accept the black box concept. It's all about the bottom line. It's about the result, because machines will do it differently. So, I was very upset about this match. And that's when people say, Gary, you know, he couldn't take it uh, lightly. It was outburst at the press conference. He couldn't accept the fact that he lost the match to the machine. I always tell people, okay, two things. First, I'm a sore loser. And I accept it. You know, you read my book, I just repeated it a few times. But the second one, it was not the first match I lost to a computer. It was the first match I lost, period. Now, since, as I mentioned already, I won the first match, I wanted to play a rematch. Okay, re rematch, the third one. And IBM did, okay, it was a good decision for business, bad for science. They recognized that at the time, machine was not superior yet. Actually, when you look at the games, analyze them with modern chess engines, you'll find out so many mistakes made on both sides. Problem is, I made more mistakes because, you know, I was a human. The best one in my field, but still a human. I, we humans are poised to make mistakes. So they retired the machine, and I was desperate trying to find it, and eventually I found it. Did I say it was not intelligent? Some people say I was not intelligent because I didn't ask for IBM stock options before the match, and it jumped 22% in two weeks. Deep Blue actually was quite intelligent enough to find a good spot for its next profession. It's making sushi in JFK Airport. <laughs> actually, good spot, so this is it's a Terminal 5 Jet Blue. I love sushi, never ate there. Okay, back to, the, back to a serious note. 1997, so I lost the match. I still knew probably I was better. I still knew we had a few more years to play with computers, and we did. So these, the competition continued for about uh, eight or nine years. But then it was over. And by the way, to understand the difference between the best chess player today, Magnus Carlsen, current world champion, and 
a chess engine. You don't need $10 million or a uh, uh, corporate, corporate uh, miracle. Something you can buy a, a, a chess engine and put in your laptop. The difference between this chess playing uh, entity and Magnus Carlsen is about the same as between Usain Bolt and Ferrari. Story is over. Now, in 1997, I already recognized, you know, it's, it's, it's in the horizon. Now, what's next for me? What's next for my game? And uh, I'm licking my wounds, ruminating, you know, making some projections for the future. So I ended up with a simple solution. You can't beat them, you join them. So what if instead of fighting them, which is useless, if we try to combine human creativity, um, human uh, intuition with machines, brute force and memory, would it be a chance to play the perfect game of chess? Because humans, you know, vulnerable to make mistakes, under pressure, blunders, machines could, you know, be immune. So how about combining this? And uh, next year, in 1998, I came up with this concept. I call it advanced chess, human plus machine. There were many games played with advanced chess. Some of them are called freestyle chess, played on the internet. And we found something very, very important. Something really important that goes way beyond black and white chessboard. That the secret of success of this combination, human plus machine, does not depend exclusively on the strengths and talent of a human. Does not depend exclusively on a machine speed computing power, but its most important component is superior process, is interface. I think that's very important for us to understand that we are here to discuss the future of human-machine relations, collaboration. And uh, whether we like it or not, our portion of, or our territory in this cooperation will be diminished. It's never-ending process. but. Machines will never perform 100%. Forget about it. There's no perfection in this universe. There is always room. There will be always room for exclusively human qualities to be added to this combination. And our goal will be to understand what is this machine? What does this machine require for this specific task? What kind of machine deficiency can be compensated by our human qualities? So that's why you can look at this, to, to, at this problem from both sides. Say, like, oh, it's terrible because there's less and less territory that we can control. You saw that so many jobs could be at stake. So, and, but still there are many jobs that are not going to be replaced because they always require human judgment. So it's about redistribution of jobs. It's about creating new opportunities. And at the same time, no doubt, many jobs will be gone. So let's look simply at, at the study of US job market. And uh, work activities, not just jobs, work activities, which means that, you know, in different jobs, that's the kind of activities you do, that require medium human creativity, 4%. Now, when you talk about uh, emotional sensing, 29%. Do we understand how many jobs are simple repetitive jobs? Do we understand that, you know, the, our belief that, you know, uh, in intellectual jobs, they are different from agriculture that have that have been uh, um, wiped out by technology at one point, 150 years ago, or manufacturing jobs that have been mostly wiped out in the last 50 years. It's not different. If you look at the history timeline, it's basically the same process. Oh, the difference is that the white collar jobs, they are, are with people who have college degrees and Twitter accounts. But at the end of the day, if these jobs require no human creativity, they will be gone. So we should think, how can we inject our unique, unique, unique human being, so uniqueness of human being, so our qualities into this, into this collaboration. And here, of course, the interface is, is, is very, very important. And again, I'm, I don't want to sound callous. So that they say, oh, this is, this. so many jobs will be lost. Yes, they will be lost as it happened before. But by the way, just remember, technology is one of the main reasons why so many of us are still alive to complain about technology. Because we live longer, surprise, surprise, thanks to technology. Not 45 years average lifespan, but 75 to 80. And now we complain that technology benefits young. Okay, 
It's the same as complaining that antibiotics put too many grave diggers out of work. We should, again, stop complaining, stop listening to this nonsense of the doomsayers, and start concentrating on practical issues. How can we make the difference? So how can we use it for our benefit? And also, stop worrying about AI, uh, killer robots, or whatever. M evil is still, it's, it's still human monopoly. It's not about the Terminator or Matrix, it's about us humans using this technology for destructive, destructive purposes. So now going to the interface. And just, you know, the good news, even for me, I'm 56. When I look at my kids, so my daughter is 12, I mean, I envy her because I understand that, I mean, she can do it instantly in, in a minute. That would take me probably an hour, and uh, even if I understand it, how she does it. But look at this, at this progress. So just Microsoft products, MS-DOS, Windows, and then you have the Surface tablets. Now with stylus, with voice command. So it's, which means the interface is getting friendlier. It offers us new opportunities to move forward. So there's so many opportunities ahead of us. We just have to recognize how to integrate our, in my case, experience, wisdom, understanding, analytical skills with this tremendous power that was, you know, we, we never thought we, we could have in our pocket. Again, just anybody remembers Cray Supercomputer? A miracle 40 years ago, this is the one of the miracles of the world. In your pocket, you have now power a thousand times, if not more, exceeding Cray Supercomputer. Do we use them effectively? Uh, I'm not so sure. So, and by the way, for those who say AI is going too fast, no, 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 it's going too slow. Because all the jobs that are doomed, they will go. But if we try to protract the agony, because we saw, the, we saw the reports, oh, people are contemplating how they invest. A lot of people will like to invest in the next one or three years. It's eternity. What are you talking, one, three years? It's, it's already happening. So that's why, again, you should, you know, you should move on. And also remember that it's, it's an early stage of the competition. Again, using the, the Microsoft analogy, people think we're at Windows 10. Ah, we're still at MS-DOS era now in AI. Which means entry now gives you a very good chance to move forward. Now, since Hollywood movies created so much hassle, so much negativism in our minds, it's like a brainwashing machine, I always wanted to find you know, Hollywood images that could prove otherwise. Does it work? <laughs> now, let me tell you why it works. Terminator first, Terminator 1. Oh, by the way, I have to mention that is the picture in the corner. It's not a Photoshop. It's a real one. I visited uh, Arnold in his office uh, in 2003, in March. We played a game of chess. He's a big chess fan. He had chess uh, as a mandatory for his kids. I was smart enough to make a quick draw. <laughs> I don't look that stupid, of course. Yeah. Uh, I think I encouraged him so much that six months later, he ran for the governor of California and won. <laughs> now, going back to the movie. The first one was human, humans versus the Terminator, the bad guy. Humans won. But remember the second and the third one. It's all about smart human plus old machine versus new machine. And because of the effective interface, the combination won. Again, I know it's a stretch, you tell me it's a stretch, but still, it tells us it's, it's all about our, us finding the right way to communicate with machines. There will be so many opportunities so for us to, uh, to move forward. And that's, you know, that's, my, you know, that's my, uh, my message. So um, again, even in the darkest images, you can find you know, sort of the, sort of the, the, uh, the bright side. And uh, I'm not saying I'm an optimist, though probably you it, I, I sound like one. I'm trying to be a realist. And uh, I don't want to debate things that are happening already. So I don't want us to waste our time by just you know, debating something like AGI, general uh, uh, AI in the future, or singularity. We should talk about something that could make effect for our lives, something that is real. And uh, here is my last slide uh, shows the cycle, because the cycle is quite typical. First, we look at machines, ah, 
they cannot do this. It's just it's, it's impossible. Then they can do it, but they're laughingly weak, like the, man, the, the machines I played in 1995. Then it's a short window of opportunity for us to play against them. It's a competition. But then they will better forever after. Now, I wanted to make this little cycle and just, it started with brute force machines that follow human instructions. Then you have smarter machines. They partner with humans like advanced chess. And then in the future, we will have something else. Operators that guide groups of intelligent AI algorithms. I would call them shepherds. That's a real transformation that is happening only now. Because right now, 99.9% .9 of computers, they are still analyzing and processing human-generated data. In the future, machines will be operating with human frameworks and will generate their own data based on our ability to create this, 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 this framework. And that's why I come back to my letter A explanation. I strongly advise to call AI augmented intelligence for two reasons. One, it, it's a better reflection of our relations with computers because we have to work with them. It's about collaboration. Second one is also psychological. Artificial sounds alien. The moment you say artificial, it's about competition. Augmented, it's about cooperation. So that's the, that's, that's, that's the overall story of, of um, uh, AI and uh, where, we, where, where do we stand with AI today and how I believe you know, we can move, we have to move uh, to, uh, to the future. So, and uh, just to have an... Uh, and just another analogy, I thought about you know, bringing a telescope. It's another, uh, not so ancient, but still old tool. It hasn't replaced our senses. It augmented our sight. In many cases, it helped us to prove the uh, concepts that have been developed theoretically. And uh, it's you know, very important for us to understand that the success of working with telescope depends on the direction. If you put it in the ground, you'll not find anything. So you just have to find the right angle. And uh, going back to Greek philosophers, they have no tools, but they have very rich imagination. They try to understand the world. They, they looked at the stars. They try to, you know, just to, to go deep into the secrets of nature. Again, just having human brains. Now imagine we have these old traditions and all this knowledge empowered by this enormous, enormous brute force of, of uh, computing power. All we have to do is to be more ambitious. If we believe in the bright future of human intelligence, we have to be more ambitious, uh, more eager to explore and empower ourselves with these new revolutionary technologies as we have done it in the past. So, Let's follow the traditions of ancient Greeks, and let's aim our telescope of the mind, AI, to the sky. Thank you. Gary, thank you very much. So are you, I, I listened to your speech very carefully, so are, are you sure that there are things that, uh, AI, augmented intelligence, will never be able to do? Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, again, it's a long story. We can start another lecture debating it. But it's the, I think there's the, there's a fundamental, I think it's this misconception, considering that AI could do things that cannot be quantified. So it's when I talked about chess, I can talk about Go, I can talk about all other games. Those are, I would cl classify as closed systems. Any closed system will give machine an upper hand. If we know how to do things well, machines will do it better. But life is an open-ended system. And machines cannot determine the moment when they cross the territory of the diminishing returns. Machines can ask questions, but they don't know what questions are relevant. Also, when we talk about creativity, people say, oh, machines could be creative. But creativity always goes against the odds. Because creativity could end up with failure. Machines cannot accept failure as an outcome. So there's still room for humans to, be, you know, to, to bring our uniqueness into the game. And I think that instead of you know, just worrying that machines could replace us, I think it's a promotion. 
because they will force us to be more human. They will help us to unleash human creativity. And if uh, having an automated car, is a, it's a closed system, right? Yes. But then should we trust it or not? How would you answer to the question I had in my head and talked about here? Okay. The, I just started. The philosophic started. dilemma. You think philosophic? I think should we protect I'm sorry, the, I'm the sorry. driver or the or the the? Do you know the answer? No, I don't. Uh, how how? If you don't know the answer, I don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer. How do you want machine to know the answer? How would we program it then? Look, that's the that's another story because it's the the only difference between us not knowing the answer because if it happens, if God forbid it happens on, uh, just on the road, it could be either outcome. You know, just people behave irrationally. The only difference is that you will know the outcome in advance. Yes. That's okay. I think maybe it's, 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 it's still a better solution because you know the outcome in advance. And uh, I would let insurance companies worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but also, also it's, let's talk about the numbers. I go back to the beginning of my presentation. It's not about perfection. It's about better numbers. Anytime driver's car hit a person, God forbid, tragedy, disaster, Human life loss, front page of a newspaper. In the United States, only nearly 40,000 people being killed in the car accidents every year. Are we just, we're simply looking for, you know, for improving numbers. I bet you in 25 years, you have our kids, our grandchildren in this audience saying, our grandparents, our parents were so stupid. They were driving cars <laughs> when they had this technology. Look at the statistics because they will simply look at the numbers. I'm not telling you that it's, we can go forward you know, without any losses. There are always losses. There's a risk. But the moment we start looking at ourselves as humanity, as humanity will always benefit from new technology. When people say, oh, many jobs that I say in radiology can be lost because machines now will do the work, terrible news for thousand well-paid jobs, let's say, in America. But look at the other side. The cost goes down. How many more people can afford it? Potentially, how many lives can be saved in India or Africa? Again, it's the, it, the, there are always trade-offs. It's like in business, it's in life. This is a history of exploration. So that's why, again, we should simply you know, move forward, recognizing the consequences, recognizing the potential setbacks, but always look at the balance. And I think the balance is positive. Thank you very much. That was very Thank positive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.